Welcome to the Theology in Motion podcast. Join us for conversations about the theology of worship, its practice, culture, and design. The Theology in Motion podcast is by the Center for Worship Leadership, Christ College, Concordia University, Irvine, in California. Welcome to Theology in Motion. My name is Steve Zank, and on behalf of the Center for Worship Leadership, we're glad that you are here. Today's guest is Dr. Simeon Zoll, University Lecturer in Christian Theology at Cambridge. He received his first degree in German history and literature from Harvard, and his doctorate in theology from Cambridge. Simeon has done some postdoc work in Cambridge and a research fellowship at St. John's College, Oxford. Prior to his current appointment, he was Assistant Professor of Systematic Theology at the University of Nottingham. Dr. Zoll also works in the theology of the Reformation, especially Martin Luther and his and the Reformation's modern legacy. Uh, further research interests include Augustine, 19th century theology, and the contributions to theology of affect theory and cognitive science. Dr. Zoll, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I'm excited to talk with you about your new book, The Holy Spirit and Christian Experience. There's a way in which those involved in corporate worship see their role as attending to Christian experience. And honestly, the Holy Spirit is not far behind in that conversation. I don't know about in the UK where you work, but in the United States, there's a very popular song by Brian and Katie Torwall called Holy Spirit. And it's an example of this phenomenon of the Holy Spirit and Christian experience being attended to in worship. The song talks about, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And then the attending experience, which is, you know, come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. So I think this is a really timely conversation for people involved in this area in worship. Can you help us understand then, in your book, the notion that there's a, a false dichotomy being set up between a theology and experience, and some folks say uh, it's almost like a divide being created. Can you walk us through what you're seeing in your book and how you encourage your reader to get past that? Yes, absolutely. So um, to me, it, it growing up um, in theology and in grad school and everything, it was I just kept being struck by the fact that um, we sort of talk all the time about sort of stuff that God does in in theory or in the soul or in sort of sort of abstract sort of kind of dogmatic terms. Um, but we have a really hard time talking about how uh, sort of the work of God is actually experienced concretely by human beings in the world. Even though, of course, you know, no one would really be bothering with this whole Christianity thing if it didn't have some kind of traction in right. their uh, embodied life. Um, you know, we wouldn't be bothering doing theology if we didn't think, uh, if it hadn't affected our lives, uh, which means experience. And um, it, the more you look into it, the more it's clear that there are some specific reasons for why, especially modern Protestant theology has had a lot of, I would say, ambivalence about the category of experience. Um and this has a, the, the, in the Reformation tradition has always been a little bit nervous about the possibility of kind of the, the, these explosions of subjectivism coming out um, if you get too far from a, a really particular sense of the priority of the word over everything else, including experience. And that, that has its good reasons, but can get kind of over applied. And then in, in modern theology, Karl Barth had this, this, this ferocious no to all forms of theology that that think they can do, um, can say anything that comes out of human experience, human culture, that kind of thing. And again, he had good reasons for saying that, but um, but the price we've paid is that theologians, even who, who want to talk well about actual uh, encounter with God in different kind of ways, you know, in a sophisticated, thoughtful way, uh, have a hard time doing so, and we need new categories. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the natural Christian category for talking about experience of God. Yeah, and you work hard in your book in the first opening chapters to help the reader think about, man, if, if I'm from a Protestant tradition that's kind of said, experience is not part of my salvation. I'm not going to intermix that category with the idea that I'm saved. I'm not going to look to my experience as some kind of measure of that salvation. Mm -hmm. But I found that you did a, a really powerful job of moving us past salvation as a, a propositional abstraction or something, but it has real-life effects. How can a Protestant reevaluate experience as a, their own category of understanding through the Holy Spirit? 
one of the reasons we've had a hard time talking about experience is because it sort of gets caught in this false dichotomy. Either you're basing your whole your sense of your of your whole sense of salvation, your whole theology around experience, or the best thing, the safest thing to do is just ignore it entirely and just go go with with sort of pure dogma or or something like that. And um, and that seemed to me just to be such a narrow sense of how experience actually functions in Christian life and even in theology. So um, I, I'll give you an example. I was um, a theologian who I'm uh, very fond of, named Karen Kilby, um, wrote a brilliant article about the doctrine of the Trinity a few years ago, uh, almost 20 years ago. And she, uh, and I remember thinking back, you know, I read this article and I was like, oh my gosh, this article is amazing. I agree with this critique of social Trinitarianism. Mm-hmm. And I found it, um, and I was thinking, you know, this is this was a, a clear experience in my life of being persuaded of a theological idea. But what was happening was all caught up with my my subjectivity, with my, you know, so I knew her. She'd been really nice to me in the line at a uh, at a conference once. So I was well disposed towards Karen Gilby. Um, she was articulating things that I kind of had thought before. And so there was a sense of, of relief, kind of, that I wasn't crazy, mm. you know, that someone else had seen the same stuff. There was a sense of kind of respect for the intelligence on display and um, and so on. And it just made me think, gosh, to be persuaded of, of a theological position is an experience. It's a thing that involves, you know, I, I got excited. My heart rate went up to some degree, you know, um, I got, uh, and so, and that doesn't mean it wasn't still a, like a, you know, something rational or something um, genuinely theological, but I basically came to think that all theology is doing that. Um, we're always doing theology in relation to what we're feeling and uh, where we're coming from and what our biases are from our past and all these kinds of things that, that we just, so you can't just to say, oh, let's get rid of all that stuff because it's potentially dangerous. Mm-hmm. is to miss the fact that it's it's already there anyway. And yeah. so it's better to to deal well and rigorously with with the fact of the way experience is always shaped in our theology than to sort of pretend we can do theology uh, separated from, from who we are and where we're coming from. It seems like uh, the, f- the folks in theology that tend to believe that uh, emotion should be very separate and very separated or experience uh, from doctrine or the church or something tend to be, uh, in my experience, very emotionally uh, charged about their <laughs> beliefs. And yeah. uh, your book serves to kind of call out, call us out to say, if you're trying to separate experience from theology, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. It's you, uh, you have lenses of your own experience to help you interpret the theology itself. And then also you're experiencing uh, your theology in real time. And it does have a, an effect on you. And so let's not just ignore it, but let's find a way to attend to talking about that. And you trace this um, this intellectual tradition through uh, Augustine, Augustine, you'd help us understand how to pronounce that name, first of all, through uh, Luther and Melanchthon in a really interesting way that talks about experience, I think in a little different way than we're used to hearing in general theology. Can you walk us through that intellectual tradition of experience? Yes, absolutely. So um, at the core of it, and this is also connected to to the Holy Spirit. So one of the main things the Holy Spirit does in in the New Testament in um, and in, in Christian tradition is uh, is to sort of the work of salvation, the work of grace mm-hmm. is the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of good reasons to think that's that's true. And so um, someone, so like someone like Augustine, his sort of theory of grace of how God's grace actually comes to take um, hold in the world in, in, in some way get come to be experienced is very much through the categories of, um, of desire of how the, the, the Holy Spirit comes and kind of transforms your desires. And that's what sanctification is. And that's for him why something like the law, just knowing the law we, uh, doesn't, doesn't do it. You have to actually do it out of a desire. Um, otherwise you're not actually following the law. You're just trying to avoid punishment. So I was just teaching about that today, mm-hmm. actually teaching on the spirit and the letter. And that's a key argument. Um, in that text. But so once you realize that, that there's this close connection between the Holy Spirit and the transformation of desire, uh, of, of willing, basically, um, you start to see that there's actually this, this long tradition um, that stems, especially from the early anti-Pelagian writings in Augustine, like on the Spirit and the Letter, um, through to the Reformers, certainly uh, Luther and Melanchthon. This is what Luther is reading in sort of 1515 at a key point as he's turning to the Romans lectures, what Melanchthon really runs with is this, uh, it's kind of a theory of, of how, how grace works and how God works and how the Holy Spirit, therefore, works in mm-hmm. people's lives. It involves 
um, a transformation of desire. And, uh, and especially it's about that sin is, is desire to sin. And so you need to be extracted from this desire. You can't just know the right thing. You have to actually not want it anymore or else you're just going to keep doing it. Um, and so that the function of the law in this tradition, which I think comes right out of Paul really is, um, is to help kind of sever, to make, make sin uncomfortable, painful yeah. and clear. And, tr- and like you just, you see it. Uh, and in that situation, you're freed, to um, see the sort of what Augustine calls the sweetness of the gospel. It's attractive. It's not just like it makes sense, but actually it's lovely. Uh, mm-hmm. And it makes you want to love God um, and positively uh, when you in, when you encounter it. So that tradition, it goes through um, Luther, Melanchthon, my own Episcopal tradition. It plays a big role actually in the early liturgies with Thomas Cranmer. Um, and I think it has a lot of traction today. Uh, you know, when you think about human beings, we do what we do above all, out of, um, out of desire. Anyone who's tried to tr- persuade someone to do something they didn't want to do, even if it's rational, <laughs> you know, how often that fails. Yeah. Uh, and so Augustine had a lot to say with that about that. And he thought that the Holy Spirit is the agent who has, only the Holy Spirit can really transform our heart. Yeah. And there's something about that uh, that I think is calling us to a different framework, potentially. Because I like how your work doesn't diminish or take away from dramatic effects of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament mm-hmm. or our own lives that maybe people might perceive as more miraculous or subjective or instantaneous or something. But you also draw our attention to this framework of uh, law and gospel, of the law that terrifies and it got the sweet gospel that consoles. And I think that just those categories, calling us those categories, is an interesting experience for someone thinking about worship. Because if you think about it, if the worship uh, leader or person who's designing worship, or however you want to describe this person, is trying to help the congregant, the congregation, to experience God, there's one place uh, that is naturally uh, having experiences through the law and the gospel— and the way that the reformers attended to that in the the liturgy, the Cramner's own liturgy, that we've talked. Uh, if you're interested in that, find an episode with uh, Dr. Robert Kolb and Zach Hicks a few months back. We go into that quite a bit with them. But there's a a quote that you actually brought forth in a new way in my mind. Martin Luther believed that only the Holy Spirit knows the art of law and gospel. And you brought that all the way back to the Holy Spirit again. Would you mind fleshing out that quote a little bit for us, that the Holy Spirit is the one who knows the art of law and gospel? Absolutely. So when we're talking about one thing that Luther was just extremely subtle in his attention to is the dynamics of how um, how theological ideas relate to to experience. And he, was, he really thought a lot about this and was very subtle and, and sensitive in his thought. And he... Um, understood that, um, he says this at a few different points, most famously in the in the larger Galatians commentary, he says, you know, um, it's one thing to know the law and gospel distinction, to be able to describe mm-hmm. it, even to teach it, you know, to, to, to quote this and that person, to justify it exegetically, those are all well and good. But when it comes down to it, the law and the gospel is not just an idea, and it's only actually a description of something, I mean, it's only in significant as far as it's a description really of something that actually happens, where you encounter the law, the mm-hmm. sinner encounters the law, and has their sin revealed, made acute, uh, and so on to clear the way for an encounter with the gospel concretely in, you know, in on a Tuesday morning, you know, yeah. uh, in July, you know, rather than kind of just in, the, in an abstract place sort of before the soul before God or something like that. And, um, and so he was very aware of how we, you know, the, the, for him actually law and gospel, in some places he says, you know, basically the law is when there's a commandment and the gospel is when there's a promise. <laughs> Other places he says, but actually it's a little more subtle than that because yeah. the heart can turn anything into a law yeah, and the heart can hear the gospel through unexpected things. And so it's partly your attitude towards it, your use, the spirit is in the use uh, mm-hmm. of, of the thing. Um, and so that's why the same, you know, verse can kind of, that, that, that when you were young, felt like the most glorious gospel verse you've ever heard. And then when you're old and you've heard it every day and you had some annoying conversation with somebody about it that you kind of want to forget, the same verse might become something that you just kind of is dry and it, right. it no longer speaks in the same way. So Luther understood that dynamic. And that's why he said, just because you think you understand the law and the gospel doesn't mean you do. And in fact, you said, you think I would know how to do it by now. I've been talking about the law and the gospel for however many years at that point, uh, about 20. And, um, 
He said, but actually, no, only the Holy Spirit yeah. knows that art. And that's his way of saying that, well, because the Spirit is free. You know, there's a dynamism to God's work through the Spirit. And so, yes, the Spirit uses the law and the gospel, but not always in the ways that you expect. And actually, if you could expect it, if you could just plan it, if you could manipulate it really reliably, then we would be God. Yeah. That, and, and so there's, there's an interaction between the complexity of the human heart that, that sometimes what, what we think, what we encounter as law or gospel is not what we expect. Yeah. Um, and and the, the freedom and work and reality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I think that's what he made. It was a caution against thinking you've, you've got it all figured out yeah. um, just because you have good theology. He didn't think the good theology was important, of course. Yeah. But. I, l- I love the way that that re- makes me think of like the statement, Jesus died for you. Mm. Law or gospel. And so if you throw that, you no, know, if you're a worship leader or someone leading worship, and you throw that statement out, uh, maybe the Holy Spirit is using that statement in different ways for people. Yeah. I've heard I've heard this phrase, Jesus, here's what I mean by that. I've heard the phrase, Jesus died for you, used as the law in the sense that, so what are you doing with your life to mm-hmm. die for others? I've heard the yes. other way that says, so you're free. <laughs> and so... Uh, yes. Such an interesting thing. Um, let's get back into this idea that you brought up of desire. I think this is actually really central to your book and actually helpful for us to think about this. This idea that the Holy Spirit's working on our desire, I think is really an interesting part of this conversation because uh, when you gather in worship, how are you thinking about what's the Holy Spirit doing? What's he working on? And a lot of times I think, uh, especially in contemporary contexts, or modern context, I shouldn't say contemporary, but uh, people who are drawing from modern musical styles and, and the theologies that come with sometimes. The Holy Spirit's work is seen as always dramatic, uh, personal, in the air atmosphere in some way, but you're drawing us into this, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit through law and gospel, working in the desire of the heart. Can you walk us through that a little bit more? I think that's a really interesting approach. Absolutely. I would love to. And I love that you're drawing out these, the, the sort of the, the way in which this, you know, thinking about this in relation to worship, it, it to me is a very natural thing to do, actually. Um, and so I'm glad to have the chance to talk about it. The, so I would say a couple of things. First, that, that kind of general worship vibe where sort of the spirit is working through this kind of, a kind of mood, mm-hmm. maybe, or something that's generated by... Um, I, I have no problem with that in the sense that human beings are affective creatures. We're, yeah. we're emotional creatures. And, and it makes perfect sense that it, you know, we're made that way by God. God works through our hearts. And that therefore, we may need to be in a kind of space. Or just as medieval people, we needed to go to a cathedral to look mm-hmm. up and feel the sense of the, the transcendence and, of God and his bigness. You know, that we need a, a context where, where maybe the, the walls come down a little bit, to, including emotionally, where we're a little more a little less defensive, a little more open. So I think a lot, often maybe that's what's going on at the level of sort of affect and emotion with some of that kind of stuff. But then um, concretely, the law... So I would say, especially, you know, if, if someone is encountering the law in a church, in a worship context, for example, um, I think often the form that might take might be actually being free to to, to acknowledge something or to, 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 to something to kind of bubble up that's already some either thing that you're resisting and fighting or some part of yourself that you're hiding or something like that. And it could be words in the song. It could be something someone said there are a lot of, th- it's not just the, the someone saying this is the law though. That's, that's can be, and often is, is the way, but, but to, that you're cre- in a situation where you're emotionally prepared maybe to, to hear something that you otherwise are too, too tightly defended to, to hear. Um, and that music has a way mm-hmm. and, and like a lot of different things, but of, of lowering defenses, allowing yeah. us to actually feel the truth, uh, maybe in some ways. And so that would be, um, so a space where you're actually, so I'm, I'm, I'm love that this is not in a musical context directly, but in yeah. the, in the, in the, um, book of common prayer, the Cranmer liturgy to, you know, to say, we have all erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We're talking about sin. We are sinners, but to say, I'm a terrible sinner is a different thing than to say we have erred from that and strayed from that ways mm-hmm. like lost sheep. The latter is something that you can, it's easier to say, it's easier to relate to. You don't feel as judged, but you feel judged, but you feel like understood, like I was erring, I was straying, I'm like a lost sheep, I'm, I'm loved somehow, and yet I'm acknowledging, I'm confessing. So there's ways in which there, there are forms of words, forms of context, musical context, where, where I think you're more able to hear something that, that you otherwise are defensive about or, or, or don't want to hear. And that's the work of the Spirit in part. Mm. You know, Only the Spirit can ultimately do it, can ultimately bridge that, that gap, I think. 
And then likewise, the gospel, suddenly this thing you've heard all day long, you know, Jesus died for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that all my life. And then all of a sudden, one day for someone, they're like, oh my gosh, that speaks. Um, and maybe they hear that in a context where, uh, where they're sort of emotionally ready. And anyway, I think very often worship is a place where that's happening concretely. Mm. Um, and that's part of why people respond so strongly to, to good worship. Uh, you know, it's something that's very, very visceral and powerful for people. How would you describe good worship? What's going on? How are people attending to law and gospel? And I'm not going to, I know that category probably isn't quite fair, but um, the idea that there's a way of approaching worship that is seen as good and a way of approaching it that's seen as less good. Let's just say it that way. Um, yeah. How is a, a, a worship design uh, and executed? What's going on with law and gospel that makes it good? Yeah, no, it does. It does indeed. I mean, I guess one thing I would say, I think law and gospel is a precise sort of technical and way of saying something that often the form it takes is, 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 is more, um, doesn't feel quite so precise yeah. as in just repentance, just feeling what sense of one's being a sinner and the sense of God's goodness and, and yeah. desire to help to be there to, to, to redeem, to save uh, in that. And that, that can be in inchoate to a certain degree in a way that when theologians talk about it, it, it sounds so precise. Yeah, um, but, right. you know, so Augustine is very, he talks about the mystery of the self, even though he talks about the law and the gospel, he also talks about the way in which sometimes we don't really understand what our hearts are doing. Yeah. So um, I think just sort of concretely, certainly a form of worship that never really allowed space for people to, for negativity to emerge as in for, 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 for guilt, for, yeah. um, uh, a sense that there's really things that we're, we're coming in with bad stuff that, yeah. that we maybe are, are, are not normally uh, exposing to the world. And so worship that somehow is, uh, so worship that's, that's not allowing that to happen. And it's immediately going rah, rah, mm -hmm. the positive, or, or jump straight to the good news before there's sort of been a space to, uh, to, to, to repent or, you know, again, for this kind of negativity to sort of emerge. Um, I, I see it's like a spring often we're like a tightly wound spring and sometimes you just you need to sort of unwind a little before the thing can really yeah. really happen um and so that would be a a, a a not so good form of worship that could that could work for some, someone who's so in such a bad way they desperately need just you know, let's bring the good news right off the bat I can imagine that that happening but more often I think a kind of wisdom about giving space for for the for the negative which before you immediately have the cavalry coming over the hill yeah you know if you if you dive in too quickly, just in a kind of a temporal sequence, if you're just diving in immediately with, with the answer, sometimes people haven't yet gotten to the point where they can hear it. So I think about, I remember reading something about some a secular writer criticizing uh, some worship song that they'd heard for some reason and saying, it's just so repetitive. <laughs> they just say the same thing over and over again. And it was really obvious that this person didn't understand what this song was. This song was very well calibrated to do exactly what it was mm. supposed to do, which is sometimes it, it's the ninth time you say it or, or sing it, you know, that, that something emerges. Yeah. Um, so there's something about uh, emotions don't come on command. And, yeah. and insofar as God is working with the things we're really feeling, that may take some, some time. So allowing space for that uh, and not being too quick with the, with the cavalry coming over the hill, uh, God's going to save the day. Um, though, of course, getting there, I hope. Um, th those would be two things that come to mind. It, that would, there are a lot of different ways to do that, I think. What do you think? Oh, I like the way you talked about that with um, the idea that Melanchthon talks about that the, the gospel consoles uh, terrified, I don't know if he uses the word souls or not, but people. And there's a way mm. in which, um, there, you call them uh, affective predicates, I think. So there's a way in which the gospel is sweet because the law has terrified you. The prospect of the yes. law has terrified you. And so, yeah. And I, and I think that's that's a lot of what we get to in our conversations in this show with people talking about this idea that uh, we need to attend to people's experience. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what people who design and plan and execute worship are doing, is attending to people's experience, helping to guide them in an experience they think is helpful, rooted in the gospel and these kinds of things. So I, I think those, are, those reflections are really helpful. And what you're saying about the, the law, giving space for it to do its work, for some people, it's already done its work, and they're coming in. For other people, uh, needs to do a little more work. And I, I think that's right. I also think, sorry, uh, assuming that someone who's coming in does actually need consoling. Yeah. Somewhere in their life, they need consolation mo mo at least four out of five times, and that, you're, that, that your ministry is, is to those who 
who need consolation. Sometimes they're more aware of it than others, but but that's also a different attitude towards the whole of what's going on in in worship in ministry. That um, you know, that whereas if you, I've been to churches where it just, it's assumed that what you need is sort of tips to get through, to, you yeah. know, to, to become even better X, Y, or Z, you know, and and you know that's all great. But but a lot of people are there, especially at this day and age. You know, if someone's showing up at church; they often have a need. Mm. Uh, and so to, to to think of yourself as, as bringing a consoling word to people, um, I think is uh, those are the churches I tend to go to anyway. I wanted to ask you, Dr. Zoll, about this part of your book that I really enjoyed, which is to draw the work of the Holy Spirit, connect it more and more to the way social science has worked, the way that we as human beings work. Um, you talked about some of the, the key places and ways you see the Holy Spirit working through these normal, everyday means. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So one consequence of once you start thinking of the Holy Spirit as doing things that actually sort of register in in our in our bodies and our in our embodied existence, our brains and you know you know in emotions and all these kinds of things, then suddenly you're you're also talking about the Holy Spirit working um, in relation to ways that that other disciplines, not just theology, can talk has interesting things to say about how we experience emotion, how we experience social relations. Um, this kind of thing, and uh, so I, I've one thing that I do a bit in the book and in other work is draw on stuff like from the cognitive sciences, uh, from social uh, cognition and stuff to think a little bit about um, what it means to have a relation to God that is that is emotionally salient, that that is capable of generating uh, you know feelings and changes of desires, a sense of of closeness or love or or or, or wrath or whatever it is. You know, there's there's things we can learn from from the social sciences in that way, um, and so so for example, you know, social uh, science of emotion, they talk about things called um, basically we all, we all have mental representations of other mm-hmm. people called relational schemas, and um, so you know when my brother walks in the room, I don't uh, say who are you, <laughs> I know what he's like, I have a script, I have a pattern, I have a sense of you know from our long history together, I basically I have a. a a, a working model of him in my head at some level that my relationship with him is mediated through. And what's interesting about that is that it's true even if he's not in the room. So my relation to my brother emotionally, relationally is, is still going, even though he's not, if I think about him or if I'm worried about what he'll think about something, all those same emotions that might happen in a, in a social relationship are happening, even if he's not there. And I think that can give us a, a little bit of a sense of um, the kind of stuff that goes on with the relationship with God. So God is, you know, he's not, physically next to me in the way that my brother is, generally speaking, post-ascension. Um, and yet God and Jesus you know, feels very, very emotionally real to people, sometimes the most yeah. emotionally real relationship they have sometimes. And so looking at the, the cognitive science can help make sense of, of how that could be. Um, but, and I guess, it, but the key move theologically, because a lot of theologians don't do that kind of work because they're worried that we're going to um, uh, be sort of thinking that, you using psychology as a source of revelation or something sure. like that. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying if, if we follow the tradition and the, and the new Testament and saying that the spirit does things that are actually uh, available to experience, then, then we can learn a little bit more about those things through, through attending to these other sciences and, and insights. I, and I think that brings up a really interesting idea is in worship. If you're trying to attend to experience, sometimes we go straight to uh, things that we would put in the category of experience but there's a way mm-hmm. in which we can attend to doctrinal truth in a way that that doctrinal truth will, by the work of the Holy Spirit, through the work of how we're made as humans, or through some kind of supernatural means, that's up to him, I guess. But mm-hmm. we can actually focus on these doctrinal truths, like law, gospel, what Jesus is doing for us in the sacrament, what's going on in baptism, all kinds of things, and that these things will produce naturally in people experience. I think that's kind of an interesting way to approach that. As you're thinking about how to help people experience God, you can actually go into the realm of who He is. Absolutely, yes. So I was just writing something about something, you know, um, one of the things the Spirit, Spirit is associated with salvation in various ways, and one of the classic things is adoption. It's the spirit yeah. who sends the spirit of the, the spirit of the son into our hearts, spirit of adoption. There are a couple of places where that gets mentioned. And, and that's, you know, what that is 
amongst other things, you know, that is the establishment of a relation. Yeah. And then, but it's not just the concept of a relation that in principle, I'm a child of God. It's, it's the kind of relationship where you can now cry, Abba father, that is somehow it is emotionally salient. You can feel close. Uh, and that that is, so on the one hand that, that can help make sense of how people actually experience their relationship with God. But on the other hand, to think about that actually brings you into these discussions mm -hmm. of, of, of what it means to be in relation to the, the son and the spirit. And, and it takes you into the theology. Um, absolutely. I, I see theology and experience as always sort of complexly interacting. Um, I definitely think that theology can help shape experience in various kinds of ways, directly and indirectly. It can inform how we do our ministry. It can also even just directly be moving sometimes. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, our experience helps us to understand um, theology. Luther said this about the uh, how you read the Bible. Uh, this is in the first Psalms lectures, I think it is. He said, um, through experience, the exegete learns many things uh, that he wouldn't otherwise know, mm. and um, uh, and vice versa. And that if you really want to understand the text, you have to bring your heart and yourself into it. To read the Psalms is to have your, uh, he calls the Psalms the school of the affections, mm. uh, is to be shaped in your in your emotional experience and your, relation, your experience of your relationship to to God. So there's a, there's a two-way traffic there between theology and, and experience that I think is really exciting. In regards to this relationship of theology and experience moving past the false dichotomy, I was talking to a friend about your book, and he mentioned a Luther quote that was worth looking into in this realm. He says, Sola experientia tele gorum facet. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Facet tele logum, yeah. yeah. He, can you describe how that fits into this double nature? Uh, yes, Luther says it? at one point, yeah, experience alone makes the theologian. Um, I think it's in the table talk, but I have to double check, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, um, he, and elsewhere, uh, yeah, so that's something that he, he, he has all these very positive things to say about experience in relation to theological method. Yeah. He talks about the importance of, of not only meditating, but sort of bringing your, your affliction to the text, to your meditation on the text. Um, and so Luther is not, is not ambivalent about bringing your experience to theology and, to, and to, to understanding the Bible in a way that later Protestants got much more nervous um, for, for various reasons. And um, so, I mean, he basically said, you know, you're, because sin is such that you're only really going to see the truth of what's there if you're coming to it from a place of need, mm. uh, a place of affliction. There's something about, um, and so for him, the, the subject of theology is always the, 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 save, the, the justified sinner, um, mm. God's saving action. It's not just generally what's God like. It's always filtered through <laughs> yeah. our, uh, through salvation. And that's, I think, what he, what he was after, that you become a good, the you become a good reader of the Bible, which is what he especially meant by theologian, yeah. through um, your own experience of, 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 of need and then also of salvation. And then suddenly it opens up as he felt that it had done uh, in, in Romans and everything. Yeah, you do a, such a great job in this book about that particular feature of theology, that it, we can't just think about it as an ontological truth, as you say, or, or like we can't just think of it as categories that exist somewhere. But every single category of theology has important affective impact on the on the human and that was one really big insight for me to as a theologian to, to remind me to think about that in those terms mm -hmm. maybe the the outcomes out of my control sometimes because the holy spirit is the one driving these experiences but still to think about that connection is really important you talk about something uh, called the intransigence i think of of affect or of our experience and i think that's a really interesting conversation I want to have with you, because I think uh, in modern scholarship about liturgy, about theology, there's a really strong push to say uh, we are, by our experience of uh, the liturgy, we are being formed. And that's true. But you call us to remember that there's a limitation to that formation because of the intransigence that we as humans experience. Can you talk a little bit to us about that? Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a word that I get from... Um from something called affect theory and especially a colleague of mine at university of pennsylvania named donovan schaefer but it's um there's a kind of recognition so in this that there are these 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 thinkers who are sort of have spent a long time saying um being very uncomfortable with, with making universal claims human beings are always like this yeah. you know men are always like this women are always like that you know th those kinds of things, getting very uncomfortable seeing the problem with those kinds of claims and so the alternative was, well, everything is constructed by our cultural context, by our language, by our practices, that human beings are very plastic mm. and that we're deeply, deeply shaped 
by the stuff that we, by language, by practices, by things like liturgies. Um, and so there's a good bit of theology at the moment, I think, that, 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 that has taken that idea and really run with it to say, you know, we are profoundly, we are so deeply shaped by these things that we could never, you know, people in the 21st century can never relate to people in the 16th century right. because we're working in different contexts with different cultures, different languages. And um, so this intransigence thing comes out of a, a work, it's actually not theological work in the first instance, but this trying to say, well, th th what about the stuff that's, there's, there's stuff that do doesn't just change very easily, you know, that you can't just shift anything by having a new idea about it or just by engaging in practices for a little while. Some stuff really resists and especially stuff maybe that has a little bit of a biological basis. People get nervous, but that's the, 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 the parts of our, our, our you know, fear of death it's not something that's just going to be completely shaped by, by cultural context. Um, that, that's an example that this guy uses. And so um, intransigence is, is a way of talking about the ways in which we resist being changed by ideas and by practices and by even by, by liturgy. So why someone might not have changed, even after 20 years of participating in something, right. they may still be the same old jerk they were <laughs> you know, to, to some degree. Um, but I think there are ways of acknowledging that insight without saying, therefore, these things aren't having any shaping effect, which, which they definitely are. So it allows you to say stuff like, well, actually people are probably, um, they're coming to worship with, 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 maybe with a kind of relatively, there's a set of experiences that people often have. They're afraid of loss of relation. They're afraid of not being loved. They're afraid of being judged. They're afraid of, uh, being, they feel shame. You know, there, there's yeah. certain things that are, you know, that are pretty common and that, um, they're not just going to be constructed by their context, um, and so you can you can minister in that light. But it was it was funny because this um, these people who are talking about affective intransigence, it just sounds a lot like what Luther says about the bondage of the will that the heart <laughs> yeah. just does what it wants, right. and is very hard to change. And just having good theology, just you know, being told the law doesn't yeah. make you do the law. And um, and it's a similar kind of set of i set of ideas, uh, but it allows us to have a language for saying you know yes, we can change through through the right. And actually, I think something like worship is more effective in dealing with intransigence mm -hmm. than, say, a lecture. Yeah. Uh, precisely because it's engaged with the level of, of affect and emotion uh, as well as, as conceptual content. Um, so uh, that's, that's, I guess, what I'm, what I'm getting at there. But I think it's, it allows you to say there are some things that are hard to shift yeah. uh, without having to say all human experience is identical at all times in the history of the world. Yeah. That, and that helped me nuance my way of thinking, you know, related to like James K. A. Smith's work on cultural liturgies and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The idea that we are shaped by these patterns around us in deep ways. Mm -hmm. This kind of research that you did and, and talked about in the intransigence helped me realize maybe why there's such a delay sometimes when we change the liturgy. You know, like in the, maybe mm -hmm. in the 70s, there was, in the 70s, there was a big shift in Anglicanism, Book of Common Prayer. Um, the way it approached sin and grace and those kinds of things. And maybe you didn't see a change right away in people, yeah. but maybe over time, the next generation especially is the place yeah. that the change is seen. So that made me think about that a little bit more in my own study about how liturgy affects the congregation in a way that mm -hmm. maybe it's not going to have a big effect right away because people are going to be intransigent about their experience. But maybe the person who's born into that congregation as a child and raised in a certain environment, that's when we begin to see a lot of these shifts and changes in the way people think about God because of their experience in worship, if that makes any sense. But to me, that was a really helpful way to nuance the way I thought about that experience. Yeah, and part of the power of liturgy is that it's repeated. Yeah. It, it takes for granted long time scales. Um, and uh, yeah, the transformation isn't just... Uh, I, I resist forms of thing, things that are that are totally anti sudden powerful emotional experiences because yeah. I think those are important and those often do happen and often people point back to key points in their life they were something a little more dramatic but not always and and at the same time there's this much longer set of time scales so um, yeah. going on and, and liturgy especially is, at its best is is taking that seriously it's like well what if we what what change would this make over over twenty years uh, <laughs> rather than just yeah. Am I going to generate an experience today? Yeah. Uh, in so that could be a good encouragement for you, listener, to think about that. As you make these choices, sometimes we think a lot about how am I helping change someone's mind or view or, or love today in this service. But maybe there's also a way in which we're looking at the long view that uh, not just those things are being changed at the Sunday morning experience, on one Sunday morning experience, but the Holy Spirit's working throughout the life of the church and 
that acts, makes us ask some different questions. Dr. Zoll, I want to ask you, I've had a chance now to ask you some of the questions that come to my mind when it comes to your research's interaction with worship. But I wanted to ask if you th- there are any categories that we've missed in this conversation. This book is so rich. It's been wonderful to read. Um, and it's, it's very approachable. Like I was saying before the interview, you do a great job at telling people what you're going to say, and then you say it. And then you tell people what you just said, which is really helpful. Are there any particular themes that your research is drawing out that you think uh, are really important to consider in the area of worship that we haven't yet brought up? Uh, thanks. That's a that's a good question. I think um, I guess what I, I especially want to um, I would want to kind of emphasize the way in which the sort of the Holy Spirit is involved in the reality of the thing, whatever whatever it happens to be, and that that there is something about insofar as we're getting at the truth of how, how we're feeling and what we're experiencing, we're some way or another, we're getting closer to where the Holy Spirit is, is operative. And sometimes that's an uncomfortable truth. Sometimes that's a a happy, unexpected truth, but there's something about, I, I guess, I think I get sad when theologies say all the right things, but aren't really listening Mm. to um, people's, what people are actually bringing in, what they're actually going through, yeah. you know, a theology that says, oh, well, well, you should be feeling this way, or all Christians should be yeah. like this, but but isn't able structurally to listen to someone saying, hey, but not me. Yeah. Um, so there's something about that just wanting to emphasize, and that, and that includes in, in worship. So, I mean, the word ideology is too strong, but to me, sort of ideology is when you have an idea in advance of how everything should be, and you're not really listening to the situation as it actually is. And there's something not just generally wise, but actually pneumatologically wise yeah. about, you know, the spirit is, in, is there in what's actually happening. Um, and so, so encouraging that kind of listening at the level of, of what's going on, what people are bringing to church, what they're bringing to worship, um, how they're hearing. And that doesn't mean that what people bring is good or right or not sort of, you know, messed up um, or in need of, of repair or, or correction, but it does mean that it's, if it, insofar as it's true, the spirit is in it. Uh, in the sense that the spirit is going to work with the real, with the reality of the thing, not not our idea of it. So that kind of integration, as you pointed out, I'm really interested in. That. So I would I I hope that this book can help give people some tools, especially who are involved in in ministries of all kind, including worship, to really to, to feel free to attend to to their experience mm-hmm. without feeling like that therefore makes them a crazy subjectivist that that that, yeah. or, or that, that somehow that means they're not still seeing the word uh, or traditional uh, as, as, as the, as the true authority here, that they're actually really good ways to, to actually the, the spirit wants you to listen, wants to listen to you to listen to what's, yeah. what's going on experientially, even if it's not the right, the right thing. Yeah. I think it's a really too abstract. No, that's <laughs> a helpful move in theology. And I, we, we just had an interview with Dr. Glenn Packiam who wrote a book on some of the sociology around uh, how people experience hope in worship. Mm-hmm. And one of his big theses was that uh, as he looked at the song selection of these traditions, uh, a lot of times the hope that Christians were singing about wasn't biblical hope in the sense of eschatological, uh, resurrected future that Christ is creating. But then his point was to say, and go back to listen to this episode if you want to hear this, listener, his point was we shouldn't then say that this hope is not legitimate hope, that the Christians feeling. And I like what you're saying. I hear what you're saying is that the sense that we can get in these theological categories and think that our work is complete by just thinking about this theology independent of the way it actually is experienced. If after worship people are telling us that there's a fearful anxiety of doing the right thing, then maybe that's a measure <laughs> that we can listen to and say, man, maybe I'm really focusing on this law and the way that people interact with it. Uh, and maybe I should figure out how to do the gospel in a different way or something. Is that kind of the realm of what we're talking about? Absolutely. That really is. Uh, that, that, that is it. And I think, like, so for example, you know, I've grown up with people who, who have a very, very clear, very powerful ideas of things like the, the law gospel distinction mm-hmm. and how they relate to ministry. And, um, but it is, it's possible to get so, so focused on it that you actually start to not hear how the, how they're actually playing out because yeah. you, you sort of know what you, you, you've decided in advance what the answer should be. And there's something about the bringing in the pneumatological, the Holy Spirit dimension yeah. 
allows a little bit of freedom and flexibility just to, to listen to how it's happening in reality. Um, so yes, absolutely. I'm glad you had Glenn on that. I hadn't, I hadn't realized he's a friend of mine. Oh, cool. He's great. Yeah, we really, it was a great conversation. It's a great new book. I find a lot of um, work in theology right now is doing a better job at attending to experience and not putting mm. theology in some kind of shelf. Yeah. No, and can I just say, it's as a theologian, I am convinced that the vast majority, much more the, the, theological shaping of actual people in the pew happens through worship than through yeah. anything that we're doing yeah. <laughs> in, you know, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in an academic seminar. Um, but really, that's how, especially people really, so that, that the, the worship side is really, really important to attend to theologically and not as sort of uh, some separate thing from theology. You know, it's, it's, it's where theology is actually hitting. Yeah getting on the ground um, in people's lives. So, Yeah, and an encouragement for the maybe the worship leader who's feeling overwhelmed by this responsibility to draw out the mm-hmm. experiential dimensions of worship for the congregation. Uh, you say in your book, uh, the law-gospel distinction, or distinctions, describes the primary pattern by which the Holy Spirit mediates between the text and message of Scripture, and the experience of the contemporary reader, and I'll just talk about reading the scripture, but I'm applying this to worship as well, to bestow the mm-hmm. gift of faith and to make saving grace experientially salient. I guess it's mm-hmm. significant because that also can help the, the leader while they're trying to do good work and they're trying to help people know who God is and give them ways to express their faith and experience Him. It can give the, the leader a little bit more... Uh, chance to breathe, because the reality is that God, (laughs) the Holy Spirit, is going to be at work through his law and his gospel. And there's a way in which you can't even control the way that that work is going to be done. So I think that uh, one of the places I see your book driving practitioners is to better understand this distinction between law and gospel. And while we can't be masters or the true artists behind this work, to better understand it, I think, to me, it seems like one of the calls that you're calling the reader of your book into, among many others. Would you say that's the case? I would. I would indeed. And that's uh, and just to, to say, it's really so so relevant. There's a lot of academic theology that thinks of some of the things like the law and the gospel distinction being being kind of irrelevant in the modern world in some way. And I just I just don't see that at all. I see it as, as very powerful. It's a tool. It always has been a tool. It's it's a it's a, it's a you know that um a way of thinking about what you know what how grace works in in the world concretely and it's a very i think it it's um i do think it especially when it when sort of christian experience sticks it's yeah. often follows something like a law gospel sequence not always in a really obvious way and I, I one of the parts of the book that was hardest to write and that but i'm i'm i guess i'm proud of is there's a part in the fifth chapter about the the, the enigma of the heart and in, in Augustine mm-hmm. sort of saying well yes there are these patterns and yet it's there's also a lot of complexity in human experience that we also, the spirit is also kind of in. Um, but fundamentally, I think it's a very power. If you're thinking of what you're doing in ministry as seeking to bring the gospel to console people who are hurting or who are suffering, who have these affective predicates of salvation, as I call them, you know, the, the, the fear, the guilt, the anxiety. Um, and those are things that people still feel all the time, yeah. all over the place. And to see your job as, as being well, above, above all things to to console such people with yeah. the gospel i think that's that's really um if people learn nothing else from from this than, than an encouragement in that direction i'd be very yeah. uh very happy and could we say it's ultimately the gospel that through the gospel the holy spirit transforms our desire mm. that the law itself isn't really transforming our desire but it's the gospel mm. Yeah, so that's that. Um, so the law is not itself transforming the desire directly at all. Yeah. Definitely not. No, it, it's but what it is doing is it's part of a. It's exposing. It's creating a condition under which desire yeah. can change. Yeah. Um, I think that's that would be the, that would be what Augustine would say. It'd be I think what Luther would say. It certainly would be what I would say. Yeah. Um, and the, so the law is really important, but it's not sort of just to be angry or just or disruptive for the sake of it or something yeah. like that. It's, it's to expose a reality that, that hurts, you know, and, and that is bad and that is destructive and yeah. uh, to, to create the possibility of healing and repair and, and salvation. So, um, so it, it is not in itself. That's the whole, you know, the law is, it 
sadly, wouldn't it be great if, if we just all we had to do was know the right answer and, and know, you know, oh, I shouldn't, yeah. shouldn't be doing that anymore. Got it. Uh, you know, no more idolatry done. <laughs> um, yeah. but so whereas the Holy spirit is, uh, and that's that point about the Holy spirit. Only the Holy spirit knows this art is that Luther is good on na- navigating between there really is a kind of pattern that's important to remember. And there's a freedom to it. And ultimately the responsibility is not, it's not you, whether the worship leader or the pastor or whatever to, if I can just figure out my law gospel technique perfectly, (laughs) get my theology exactly right, then it'll all work. It it does matter in various ways, but in the end, it's, it's only the Holy spirit knows this art. And thank goodness we, uh, the burden is not finally on us. Yeah, There's a great section in the book that uh, I encourage listeners to get a copy of it and, and read on how the Holy Spirit is still working the law in modern society. There's a kind of this claim in some corners of theology that the idea that our, we're terrified by the law of God is actually passe and doesn't apply to us in modern world. You do a great job tackling that kind of critique and, and showing the ways in which the Holy Spirit is still working the law in our society. So take a look at that. I want to ask a closing question of you. It's a question we ask a lot of our guests. And take, take a minute to think about it if you'd like to. The question is kind of hypothetical German thought experiment. And this is the situation. This is the condition. There is a, a highway upon which everyone who's in a leadership position of worship on a Sunday morning or something has to drive on this highway on their way to their churches. And we're going to put a billboard on the road right there for them to see on their way in. And uh, if we asked you to help us come up with what should that billboard read that everyone is seeing on their way in, what would you want them to be reading? Yeah, gosh, that's, uh, that's a great one. I mean, at one level, my book is sort of trying to say that it'll need more than the billboard, uh, <laughs> but it won't do nothing. So um, let's see. Uh, it would have to be something about the priority of mercy, mm. You know that that when in doubt, don't make it complicated, mm. uh, but give, bring consolation, uh, something to, to to that effect. Because I think there's a lot of other stuff to do and to say, but but if you're not doing that, and you don't have anything really to offer to mm. to suffering people, and and um, uh, so gosh, what it, what what form that would take? I mean, so for example, I wouldn't say so Melanchthon's wonderful pithy quote: "The law terrifies, the gospel consoles." <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's a really powerful, brilliant theological claim, but I wouldn't put that on the billboard. Yeah, right. Um, I, we already have to manage, to, have to have to work it. To, to, I, I would almost just want to say something that's you know, <laughs> come to me, all you who yeah. uh, are weird and heavy laden. So something I would just want to emphasize the mercy and the compassion. Yeah. As the heart of of ministry. Um, not as the only thing, but as the heart. Yeah. Dr. Zoll, I really appreciate the time you spent with us today talking about Holy Spirit, Christian experience, how it relates to worship. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. It's uh, wonderful to be on here. Thanks. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of Theology in Motion with Dr. Simeon Zoll. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. The song that you are hearing right now in the background is a new Center for Worship Leadership, the Psalm Library release of Psalm 72, Long Live the King. The Psalm Library is a project where we pair theologians and songwriters uh, to write psalm settings for the church. This one was written by Dr. Paul Elliott, the lead Hebrew scholar at Concordia University in Irvine, and Kip Fox. Join us next month here on Theology in Motion for an interview with these two artists and to talk about the way this process worked for them, writing the song together, and to explore the ways the theology of Psalm 72 can help us worship leaders think through our task. So join us then. If you happen to listen to this episode before November 12th at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, you can join us for the premiere of Long Live the King on our YouTube channel, the Center for Worship Leadership. Subscribe there, our Facebook page, uh, Twitter, these kinds of places. And you can actually join us for the eight-minute presentation at 2 p.m. November 12th, 2020 of the this work of this song, It's going to be a fun time. I hope you join us for the premiere. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of Theology in Motion, and have a great month.